Page, yeah. The next two motions are to approve statutory rules relating to the health protection coronavirus restriction regulations. There will be a single debate on both motions. I will ask the clerk to read the first motion, then call on the Minister to move it. The Minister will then commence the debate on both motions. When all who wish to speak have done so, I will put the question on the first motion. The second motion will then be read into the record and I will call the Minister to move it. The question will then be put on that motion. If that is clear, we shall proceed. Clerk, please read the motion. That the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment No. 9 Regulations Northern Ireland 2020 be approved. I call Junior Minister Kearney to formally move the motion. Iram Gajian Ruin and Runa Clerk on Can I Beg to Move? Thank you. Uh, the Business Committee has agreed that there should be no time limit on this debate. And I now call the Minister to open the debate on the motion. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. There are two motions before the Assembly today, and with your permission, I will address both of these in my remarks. I will begin by outlining for members the changes brought about by these regulations and the reasons behind the Executive's decisions. Firstly, Amendment No. 9 contained only one substantive amendment. Regulation 6, 6A and 6B, which placed restrictions on gatherings, is amended to allow for gatherings of up to 30 people in public places and outdoors. Allowing up to 30 people who are not members of the same household to meet together outdoors is consistent with step three of the executive approach to decision making. The executive considered this relaxation would offer benefits in terms of personal well-being, the promotion of responsible social interaction, and a sense of a gradual return to normality, Mr. Speaker. And that's something I'm sure we would all welcome. It means that for the first time in many months, our citizens have the opportunity to meet with their friends and family and share their time together. Secondly, Amendment No. 10 contained a set of substantive amendments, and these reflect a number of decisions taken by the Executive on the 2nd of July. These decisions were taken after careful consideration of the available scientific and medical advice, and they are in line with the timetable of indicative dates previously published by the Executive in order to facilitate the reopening of businesses and other services. The amendments include Regulation 5, Restrictions on Movement, that is Regulation 6A and 6B, Restrictions on Gatherings, are amended to permit the reopening of museums, galleries and bedding shops from 3 July. Regulations 5, 6A and 6B are also amended to permit the reopening of massage, tattooing and piercing businesses from the 6th of July, and to permit the reopening of spas from the 6th of July, but not insofar as they provide services relating to water or steam. Regulations 5, 6A and 6B are further amended to permit the restricted opening of restaurants and bars in registered clubs from the 3rd of July. Some changes have also been made for reasons of consistency and clarity. Firstly, the reference in Regulation 5 to who might attend a funeral has been removed now that the numbers of people permitted to gather outside have been increased. Secondly, a change has been made to Regulation 6 to clarify that summer schools and schemes can operate. And thirdly, technical amendments have been made to Regulation 3 and Regulation 6 to correct the numbering of subparagraphs and to clarify that beer gardens can sell and serve alcohol without food. These relaxations are aimed at boosting well-being and also allowing our citizens to re-engage with our tourism, cultural and service infrastructure. They will assist in the restart of the economy by helping to protect the jobs of those who work in these sectors. Their wider supply chains and, importantly, contribute towards an increased sense of normality. 
I'll ask Kian Corlea, as I have explained before, the executive will not be rushed into making decisions simply as a result of artificial deadlines or to match decisions taking place in other jurisdictions. We have, as we've discussed in the past, come a long way from when the coronavirus restriction regula regulations were first made. And we have seen great progress as a result of everyone's concerted efforts in the intervening period. Regrettably, other places have not experienced our relative progress to date. Jiri Narelaha agas korhegya naimanish majer lishnis renta awelu agas tashid agobar darera kela. The regulations and the executive's approach to easing restrictions have worked and are continuing to work. Sawalo baha, lives have been saved. Our health and social care systems have not been overwhelmed. Businesses are beginning to reopen and services are returning. And our citizens for the first time in a long time are beginning to enjoy being able to do more. But it is important to acknowledge that the battle against COVID-19 is far from over. We cannot afford to drop our guard for a moment when it comes to keeping people safe. All of these relaxations were agreed on the basis of the most up-to-date medical and scientific advice. And crucially, they were adopted on the stipulation that all relevant public health guidance and mitigating measures are implemented in advance of those sectors reopening. Mr Deputy Speaker, further to the amendments being debated today, I will take this opportunity to note some of the other changes that have been agreed since these regulations were laid. On Thursday, the 9th of July, the Executive agreed a range of other measures. This included the reopening of cinemas, bingo halls, amusement arcades, indoor fitness suites, indoor and outdoor gyms, and playgrounds from the 10th of July. A return to competitive sporting events without spectators, both at grassroots and professional level, and it also extends to include horse racing and equestrian competitions from the 11th of July. The reopening of libraries from the 16th of July, the reopening of indoor leisure centres or facilities but not swimming pools from the 17th of July and the resumption of indoor weddings, baptism and civil partnership ceremonies with numbers to be determined on a risk assessed basis by the venues. The executive also agreed that the wearing of face coverings on public transport would become mandatory from the 10th of July, except for people for whom an exemption applies. Alias Concordia, these changes were given effect in the amendment number 11 made on the 9th of July, and members will have an opportunity to debate these measures in due course. We are now at an important point in the course of the COVID-19 pandemic. We are beginning to look beyond the response phase towards the actions that will be needed to secure a robust and sustainable recovery, rebuild public services, and seek to restore more normal ways of living. She Duchlana Taroin Anish, Nana Bali, Agus Namoana, Konation Oban Chamak, Lega Meomaj, Abalta, Trevsha Ella, Dan Akaj Marfak Shaw, Awanastu, Maskal. The challenge facing us now is to find the ways and means to achieve that whilst managing the risk of a second wave of this deadly virus, were that to transpire. The Executive will therefore be monitoring the impact of all of these relaxations very carefully. We are prepared to reintroduce restrictions if this is considered necessary to control the virus. But our focus needs to be to ensure that that does not happen. Vigilance and caution continue to be essential as we move through the coming weeks. All of the practical advice continues to apply. Fanagi or Hulonakela, Niagi or Lawa. Keep your distance and wash your hands well and often. I commend the regulations to the Assembly, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. I now call on the Committee Chair of the Executive Office, Colin Graham. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I rise to speak on behalf of the Committee for the Executive Office. There has been much debate in the Assembly and its committees, and indeed in the media, about recent amendment regulations. And although the Committee for the Executive Office has discussed issues 
around the outworkings and alleged breaches of the regulations, it does not have responsibility for scrutinising the legislation. The statutory responsibility for that lies with the Health Committee, and I am sure that the Chair will provide a detailed commentary. However, the Committee for the Executive Office welcomes the timely lifting of all of the restrictions that are mentioned and encourages continued discipline and compliance with them. I would now like to take an opportunity to make a few remarks as an SDLP representative, Mr Deputy Speaker, and highlight that this continues to be a very worrying time uh, with the number of spikes in community transmissions. People have been very worried about the outbreaks in places such as Limavati. This scares people, uh, and we need to continue to do all that we can to try and manage our behaviours and approaches to everyday life so that they are done in a safe manner. Today's restrictions that are eased include the allowing of gatherings of up to 30 people outdoors and permit the reopening of key businesses and high street venues to allow a greater sense of normality to return. Now we can see museums, beauty parlours, spas, bars and restaurants and summer schools take place. But always underpinning these re relaxations is the need to remember to keep, a so to, keep to social distancing guidelines and to wash our hands. Businesses across these islands have been impacted the most, yet some have had to bear the brunt more than others. Our hospitality sector has felt the full whack of this pandemic, and to have them permitted to reopen in even a small way is a move in the right direction for them. The regulations, though, continue to cause confusion. I worry about an executive that cannot relay messages to people and then gets upset when people don't stick to the guidelines. Well, if you don't even stick to the guidelines yourselves, what hope is there for people in our communities to stick to them? People are angry at the one rule for us and one rule for them that some have displayed. And I would say, ministers, please go back to Stormont Castle today and shout clarity at the top of your voice. Let simple, clear and effective messages be the mantra from here on. Stop the confusion, stop the double standards and let people know exactly what they can and cannot do in an easy to understand way. As my committee has heard, you have 45 or more press officers, the cream of the crop. They should be able to help you to spread that message clearly. And let's not fall into the easy to fall in trap of trying to make this pandemic a green and orange issue, an us and them battle a day. I ask this executive office and its ministers to pull together and do what is in the best interests of people here, based on the scientific advice that is available to you. Because these restrictions are impacting all of us, be it where you can go, who you can be with, and even if and when you can go on holiday. Most of us have stuck by the rules, and most of us have ensured that we lead by example. I know that some members have felt the heat of this more than others in recent days, and I think of my close family overseas that I haven't been able to see since last year. But rules are rules, and the anomalies of these guidelines continue. I mean, if we examine what is cleared today and introduced a few weeks ago, we can now have 30 people permitted to gather outdoors in a socially distanced manner, but not if they choose to watch a sporting event. It is an oddity that people can gather in large numbers to eat and drink indoors, yet they cannot gather outdoors to watch a sport, even with proper social distancing and safety measures in place. I hope for the immediate future of the GAA, soccer and other sports that this rule is revisited tomorrow at the executive meeting and that the Minister can give us his view on that today. Many of these sports need the gate fees from those that are attending to be able to survive. They can do it safely. They can do it properly. They just need the executive to be on their side. And I hope that this is possible and that we can see this change tomorrow. I have written to the First and Deputy First Minister and asked for this change and hope that it will be reflected in what we hear tomorrow, which will be proposed. But I hope too that other members here today will support me in their contributions to help our sporting community to allow spectators back safely to sporting events. 
Mr Deputy Speaker, I welcome these further easements detailed today. I believe that we all should be supporting them, and I encourage clarity at all times. Thank you. I now call the Health Committee Chair, Colin Gildenew. I would like to speak on the amendment number nine and amendment number ten, uh, which we were briefed about in Health Committee on the 9th of July. The Chief Environmental Officer has advised us of the main easements for each, as outlined by the Junior Minister this morning, and reminded the Committee of the 21-day period and the process for bringing proposed easements to the Executive for consideration. Once again, the Committee inquired about the commencement dates applying to different easements and were reminded that changes are made as quickly as possible since, under the original regulations, restrictions must be withdrawn as soon as they are considered not necessary. A number of members raised concerns about notice and preparation time for those affected. It was noted, for example, that the amendment that increased from 10 to 30, the maximum number of people who could gather outdoors, came into effect the same evening that the regulations were laid. Members inquired whether advance notice was given to, for example, the PSNI ahead of changes to regulations. The Environmental Health Officer had no knowledge of advance notice being given to enforcement authorities at, this, at that time. The committee again inquired about the scientific evidence underpinning decision making and noted that a written request for further detail remains pending. Again, assurances were sought in relation to the health and safety of workers in light of the outbreaks and recent outbreaks in Leicester and also in Germany. We were advised that the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Scientific Advisor are monitoring situations elsewhere and are keeping regulations under constant review. The CEHO also confirmed that work was underway to restructure the regulations to improve clarity and coherence, given that there have been so many sets of amendments. It is clear we have moved from a list of reasons to leave home which has grown so lengthy that it would now make more sense to state what is not permissible. Further to a question on guidance, the CEHO advised that whichever department sponsors a particular change is then responsible for producing any guidance required in relation to that. The examiner of statutory rules had not had a chance to report on the regulations prior to the committee's consideration since they had only been laid a few days earlier. The committee therefore agreed to support both these SRs subject to the examiner's report. And the examiner has now since reported and has raised no issues with the statutory regulations. I'd like now just to say a few remarks in relation to my own role as Sinn Féin health spokesperson. It's important that we consider the reality that clusters may become all too frequent occurrences here. It is vital that the testing, contact tracing, self-isolation and supports are in place to meet the needs of those people who are tested and, to, and test positive. We have seen an example of this in re, from recent events in the Limavady area. It is welcome that the system has been able to respond in relation to that cluster, but we need to ensure that vigilance remains to mon mon monitor and manage those situations as and when they arise. I am concerned to hear reports that some testing kits produced by Randox do not meet safety standards, and I would urge the Minister to come forward with information and provide some answers as to how this affects the North here. I sincerely hope that there is no risk to citizens here, and it doesn't put anyone off or deter them from being tested. Testing still remains undoubtedly an important part of the public health response, but so too does the issue of PPE. Uh, I am also worried that the, the Randox issue could negatively impact on the capacity for testing that is required here and would like to hear further information in relation to that. As the restrictions are lifted, it is important that we remember that many key workers still, still need to have access to vital PPE to do their job. Just this week, dentists have been allowed to open up, but they are doing aerosol generating procedures and concerns remain about their access to vital PPE and who is expected to provide and source this. I would be keen that this issue is resolved as a matter of urgency. I call Pam Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And uh, I must say that I felt somewhat deflated as I thought upon this speech today, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The unity of purpose that typified the response of this assembly and executive is now sadly so damaged. Um, often I have in the past referenced the United approach in dealing with COVID-19 in my comments, and we, but we now see more and more that one party 
and their selfish objectives trump all else, and that's very disappointing. I think the public share my sense of disappointment, of anger and of disillusionment with those for whom the public health and adherence to our own rules were cast aside, Mr Deputy Speaker, and yet we still have no apology. Turning to the specifics of the changes in the amendments before us, I do welcome the fact that we now have an increase in the numbers allowed at outdoor gatherings to 30. Socially, we have some way to go, whether that is to reinvigorate community or attend family or other events. It is also worth remembering that the figure of 30 is the total of the gathering, not an element. And for some, I think that clarity is needed. Obviously, a priority in all these decisions alongside the public health considerations is the economic well-being of our people. Jobs, Mr Deputy Speaker, must be protected. Alongside the public health considerations is the economic well-being of our people. It is good that more services, include, including those uh, contact industries, are now reopened. However, I would urge the executive to do more to signpost employers and business owners already stressed to relevant guidance for how to safely operate. We will have much more to do on the journey back to normality. A walk down the high street in Northern Ireland shows us the challenges that we face. Shutters down, some permanently, each business gone, representing jobs lost and households plunged into uncertainty. As we look ahead, we must ensure that we look at the most effective ways to sustain these businesses. Sticking plaster solutions don't work. An opportunity to do things differently is now before us, and we should have everything on the table in order to ignite our economy. Mr Deputy Speaker, we have heard much around whether it is right or wrong to travel on holiday in the last day or two, whether quarantine is necessary. Clarity is needed, and I welcome the comments from the First Minister that tidying up needs to be done in terms of the regulations and the subject of essential travel. And I would urge the Executive to concentrate on actual science-based evidence, and perhaps the Junior Minister can uh, furnish this House this morning with the relevant R rates across not just Northern Ireland, but England, Scotland, Wales, and indeed with our neighbours in the Republic of Ireland. We need to give clear guidance as an Assembly, and the general public want to know what they can do and uh, how they can do that with as little risk as possible. Mr Deputy Speaker, test, track and trace and isolate is now in place. So let's keep reminding people to be tested if any of the symptoms of COVID-19 are present. Let's keep a distance from others, wash our hands. Let's volunteer to wear our face coverings in shops. Let's look after ourselves and each other. From a health perspective, I again make a plea for the urgent reopening of services and I would also highlight the plight of the dental practices and urge the Minister to engage with the sector to ensure that they are supported throughout this difficult period. The wider issues are well highlighted and the rationales are clear. Just this morning we heard from a consultant orthopaedic surgeon, uh, Mr Gavin McElindon, who had aired his fears and frustration around the pace of reopening surgery. Mr McElindon's words were that the, advoc the advocacy of their suffering patients was falling on deaf ears. And this does concern me, and I'm worried that we're not even listening to our conditions now. Many, many people are, including my husband, in fact, are waiting for general surgery. Many, many people are suffering in great pain, and this is due to the lack of our health service at this time. Waiting lists are growing, the lists that were already at an all time high before this pandemic. The department is right quite rightly trying to suppress the virus and we are all eternally grateful to the Department of Health staff and to all our amazing health workers who go far and beyond the call of duty to look after others. If this is an opportunity to transform services in order to work in a more efficient and safer manner then let's do that but let's do that with haste and with recognition that the people of Northern Ireland are suffering and deserve to have services resumed as a matter of urgency. This all, of course, adds to the mental health issues, and I would urge the Assembly to back the Health Minister in reopening health services with utmost urgency. How many will lose their life or become incapacitated because of the lack of action to resume health care? In conclusion, Mr Deputy Speaker, I welcome the visitor attractions, museums, galleries, and the bookmaking offices have also been able to resume business. And I would conclude my remarks by thanking the public and appealing for continued compliance with the guidance and adherence to the regulations. Let's remember what this is about. It's about saving lives. And I do at this point just want to say that I'm very proud of those who have organised a very safe, lawful 12th celebration this year. I think that's something to be very proud of. So in conclusion, I support the amendments 9 and 10 of the Health Regulation, Coronavirus Restrictions Regulation, Northern Ireland 2020. Thank you. I call Kelly Armstrong. 
Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. I'm rising here without a prepared speech because I'm so angry I could bite something. Um, I have to say that while 9 and 10 allows people to go and stay in overnight accommodation, um, even though we had had a cross-party motion in this place recognising the pressure on carers, we can still not have overnight respite care for people with disabilities or older people. I appreciate that these um, rules and regulations are being laid in a specific way that's adhering to legislation, but our carers needs falling on deaf ears. And I will say to both junior ministers this morning, go back to the executive and you ask the executive to sort things out for carers. We heard over the last few days that some respite services may be available and daycare centres may be open for 10% of people with learning disabilities and older people. Honestly, we have carers who have been working 24 hours a day, seven days a week for 16 weeks. They are at breaking point. How many times do we have to ask in this place for their needs to be recognised? Fantastic, we can all go and stay in a B&B. &B. We can go to the boogies, but we cannot give a carer a break. I am so angry about this. We, had, we worked so hard together as parties to recognise the needs of those carers. And for those people with disabilities who, to be quite honest, are sick looking at their family because they can't go out through the door still. And we don't, we're not looking after them. So what I would say to you, and I reiterate what Pam Cameron has said, we need to look after ourselves and each other. And I would please ask you to put to the front of that queue carers. They have been part of the rainbow of heroes, heroes throughout this pandemic. They have worked away quietly in the background, and as we recognised in the motion, they have been scared, they have been alone, they have been isolated, and they have done all of this without much thanks or any recognition. And I would really push forward to say the next regulations that come forward, we already know what they are, they've been talked about today, the next ones that haven't been written yet needs to have carers there. We need the minister to go back to those trusts and to say that there has to be fair and equitable treatment of all people with disabilities and older people and their carers across Northern Ireland. And I make this plea, while 9 and 10, regulations 9 and 10 are absolutely welcome, it's the people who are doing the work on the ground looking after our most vulnerable in society that need our help now. And I am asking, I am pleading with this Assembly and with the Executive to please put carers first in your next considerations. Thank you. I call Pat Sheehan. Good morning, the last count, Paula, uh, and I welcome these amendments here today, uh, amendments 9 and 10. And it's a further relaxation of the draconian restrictions that have been posed since the start of this pandemic. Uh, and of course, under normal circumstances, none of us would have been supporting those restrictions. But uh, given the circumstances, they were absolutely necessary. Uh, <clears throat> and these amendments uh, give effect to a previously announced indicative timings uh, for, for the opening of among other things, museums, galleries, bookies, spas, tattoo and piercing uh, businesses, restaurants and bars and clubs, uh, and, and funerals are no longer restricted to close family and friends, beer gardens can open, and so on. And I welcome the easing of these restrictions. And it, it indicates that uh, to an extent, we're getting on top of the virus, but the situation still remains extremely dangerous uh, and we need to listen uh, to the experts in the fields, particularly in the field of public health. And uh, I, I heard Pam, Pam Cameron mention the R number uh, there earlier in her speech and that was the third time I heard it today. The uh, leader of the Ulster Unionist Party was on the radio this morning also mentioning it. And I also heard Gabriel Scali, who is uh, preeminent in the field of public health, probably one of the most renowned experts on these islands on public health. And he was saying when the transmission rate is as low as it is, uh, particularly here, uh, the R rate itself, in itself isn't a useful measurement to use. Uh, what's more important is the number of people who are being infected. So we need, to, we need to listen to the experts on these issues, and we need to look also at the countries that have done best in suppressing the virus. 
And there are many of them uh, across the world who have done uh, particularly well. Places like New Zealand, Taiwan, Hong Kong, uh, Germany, and so on. And we need to look to see what they're doing. Uh, and uh, a lot of the advice we're getting, and again, it's from people like Gabriel uh, Scali, Davy Schrader, who's advising the uh, Scottish Parliament in, 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 in Edinburgh, uh, is for the purposes of public health to treat the island of Ireland as one unit. So we should be coordinating north and south all the, the moves that were taken in relation to the virus. It was welcome that there was an MOU a few months back, but that in itself isn't enough. There needs to be constant contact between the executive uh, and the uh, Dublin government uh, and the, both chief medical officers and chief scientific advisors as well. So that's what we need to do. Uh, and, we, and we need to continue to find, test, trace, isolate, and support. Uh, that's what's going to keep the virus suppressed. Uh, and that's the message that needs to go out. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I think, Mr. Deputy Speaker, it's important uh, that the public recognise, and we all recognise as well, that the executive uh, is trying to do a job of work. They're trying to strike a balance. They're trying to strike a balance between helping to get the economy back on its feet, trying to get people back to work, uh, trying to get basic services available uh, to us all. Um, and it's trying also, whilst doing that, to protect public health as best it can. But I think that we've got to be uh, recognise that any relaxations uh, of these regulations is not an invitation to the public to let their guard down or to relax their own personal measures to prevent the spread of this virus. Social distancing, personal hygiene are still paramount uh, in controlling this virus. So we all, as uh, civic leaders in a way, we have to set an example and we have to continue to adhere to the guidance as best that we possibly can. This virus has not gone away. And it's not relaxing its efforts uh, to spread. And I think that, you know, we hear a lot about uh, confusion, that the guidance is confusing. And yes, there could be clarity uh, in some elements of it. Always have to recognize, of course, that it is emergency regulations and it's, it has been, it's, it's maybe not been put together uh, with the same scrutiny that, that law would normally attract. So we'll have to accept that uh, there will be uh, clarity needed maybe in certain sections of it. But I have to say uh, today in this House that a lot of the confusion has actually been created, not by the wording of the regulation, it's been created by the actions, selfish actions, of parties in this House and indeed civic leaders in this House, we do have a responsibility to absolutely adhere to the regulations. If we can't, how can we expect the public uh, to, uh, to adhere to it? And I mean, the R number, yes, I heard uh, Gabriel Scali this morning on the radio, and I hear he's an extremely prominent professor. Um, to me, he's just a voice out there that has an opinion. Uh, and I don't put any more weight on what he has to say than what I hear from our own experts that we have uh, employed to advise us. And the R number, uh, you know, only weeks ago, it was considered to be absolutely paramount. We were all hanging on it, waiting for when the executive would announce the latest R figure. Uh, and it became the habit that it was announced every Thursday, and we all waited uh, with bated breath to hear what it was, because it, is, uh, it was considered to be a very, very important indicator of how we were controlling the disease. I don't think now that we can simply discard 
uh, the R number. I think it still is a scientific uh, figure to be looked at and to be considered, and I hope that the, the executive will con con continue uh, to consider it. In terms of the Amendment 9, um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, we've heard that it was uh, discussed by the executive on the 29th of June. Um, it was signed off at 9.30 that Monday evening, and it became law at 11 p.m. And I did raise uh, with the Chief Environmental Officer uh, at the Health Committee that I thought that when laws have been changed, I, I don't think it's good housekeeping uh, to change them uh, in the middle of a day. I think that they, they really should be changed and come in to uh, end the law on a date as opposed to a time. Um, and the, the sort of confusion that I, that I pointed out to the Chief uh, Environmental Officer was the fact that on the 29th of June, when that became law at 11 p.m., that was legal for 30 people together as opposed to 10, that it wasn't really fair to the enforcement agency, which in this case the PSNI, who might be out on patrol and at five minutes to 11 come across uh, a gathering in excess of 10 and would take the, whatever they consider to be the appropriate action, either advice or, or if necessary, the issue of fixed penalty tickets. But yet they could come up that same road at five past 11 uh, and encounter uh, a crowd of people in excess of 10 not uh, respecting social distancing or anything else, um, and the police would speak to them, totally unaware that at 11 p.m. the law had changed and that now 15, 16, 18 people gathered uh, was actually legal and compliant with the regulations. So I think that has the potential to create embarrassment uh, for the enforcement uh, agency. And when I asked the Chief Environmental Officer, did they have any um, conversation with the police uh, during that Monday to give them a sort of a heads up that the regulations in respect of, of gatherings was going to change at 11 o'clock that night or whatever time was deemed to be the time, uh, he said no, they hadn't. And he said that the normal practice would be to uh, inform uh, local authorities and the PSNI the following day uh, of, of any regulations that had changed. And I, I don't think, from a housekeeping perspective, I don't think that really is satisfactory. And I think that I, I know that the, the executive have a duty to, when they decide that they can relax uh, a regulation, to do so quickly uh, and give the, the public the benefit of it. Uh, but I think that it would be, you know, as I say, from a housekeeping perspective, it would be much better that it was something that kicked in from midnight uh, on a date uh, as opposed to uh, a time uh, during, during the day. As I say, I think it's unfair to, to the enforcement agencies. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I call Doug Beatty. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I think I'll be uh, rather brief. Um, the, the, the slow drip feed of, of easing of COVID restrictions uh, is welcome, and it's absolutely the, the right way to do things. We have to look at what's ahead of us and then change uh, to meet that. Um, and it's important that we do that, and we try to analyse uh, and listen to the advice when we uh, do that. Uh, the opening of museums uh, and galleries are incredibly important, so people can go uh, and view our history, uh, understand our culture, see our art. Um, and if we don't have that... Uh, if we don't allow people to get out there and enjoy that, if we don't remember what we're doing this all for, then, then what is the point? It's, it's incredibly important, and, and, and I welcome that uh, release in restrictions. In the same way, I welcome the, the release in restrictions of opening of restaurants and bars, although with certain uh, caveats, because it, it kick-starts the pulse uh, of our society, uh, and our society need to have something to look forward to, and restrictions, restrictions, restrictions uh, is not the thing uh, that, that's, that's going to help us or even help the mental health uh, of our society. And I absolutely agree with the, the chair uh, of the executive office for the executive. Um, clarity is what's really important, 
uh, and that is digging down to the absolute detail of everything we put out there so people know exactly what they can and cannot do. And I guess that's where the confusion is at the moment, is people are just confused because we're giving confused messages. We're giving confused messages in our guidance. We give confused messages in our legislation. We're giving confused messages when we stand up and we make statements. And it's important that we have clarity. But I'll also agree that the integrity and the credibility of the executive office uh, has been seriously damaged. Uh, and it's been seriously damaged uh, by Sinn Féin, who seem to have got selective amnesia because they never talk about their deliberate breach of the guidelines that they told everybody to adhere to. And this number of going up to, to, to 30, allowed to gather in groups of 30, which come out at 11 o'clock uh, on the 29th, um, and yet they managed to get their little cabal of 30 um, ready for the next day for, for a funeral. Not mentioning all the other hundreds that followed on behind it, who must have been well organized, well in advance. They certainly weren't given the heads up um, at 11 o'clock that night to, to be there. And when you talk about this selective amnesia, we now have a society who seemed to have brushed that under the carpet because what that did was abused our society. What they did at that funeral abused our society. There wasn't 30 there, there was hundreds there and it abused our society. And many in our society are now suffering from Stockholm Syndrome because they've just forgotten about it. It doesn't matter, they're allowed to do it. Nobody else is allowed to do it, but they can do it. I think it's absolutely shocking. And then for anybody to stand up and say, don't worry about the R number. Don't worry about that R number. It's not important anymore because it doesn't fit our narrative. And yet we've just had four months of people buying on to us about the R number. We've got to get the R number down. We've got to save lives. And then somebody says, ah, never worry about that because we want to stop the English coming to Northern Ireland. That's what it's all about. It's a bias. It's a bigotry. And they need to own up to it. I'll finish and say this again, uh, Mr. Speaker. Of all of these amendments, clarity. Clarity in everything we do. Clarity in everything that we say is the most important thing. Thank you. I now call on Junior Minister Gordon Lyons to conclude and wind up the debate on the motion. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And as we have said previously during these debates on the amendment regulations, we all want to see a return to a more normal way of living. None of us want to have to be legislating for how people and businesses go about what we consider to be normal routine activities. And we all look forward to a time, hopefully soon, uh, when we no longer have uh, to do that. However, that time is not yet here. Yes, we are winning uh, the fight against COVID-19. And yes, we have come a long way and made great strides towards a return to something approaching normality. But the job is not finished. It's very clear that managing a response to the COVID-19 pandemic, keeping people safe and supporting those who have faced real hardship as a result of the pandemic is going to be a top priority for us all for some time to come. The executive approach to decision-making document remains our blueprint for the review process and the incremental structure for assessing progress contained within the document will continue to help decision-making in key areas in the weeks ahead as we ease our way further on the pathway towards recovery. Now, we have learnt uh, a great deal and come a long way in a short period, and there is much to be optimistic about, and uh, we can all uh, look forward to um, moving forward uh, and responding to COVID and recovering from uh, its impact. Progress has been good, and we've made significant strides in easing the restrictions that have been in place. And as a result, and provided that we keep our guard, we can look forward uh, to further positive changes uh, very soon. I'd now like to turn to some of the points that members uh, have made uh, during uh, today's uh, debate. And we begin, uh, as always, uh, with the chair of the uh, Executive Office uh, Committee. And I, I, I again uh, thank him and, and welcome his support um, for the progressive but cautious uh, direction of travel set out in the, in the regulations. And he 
rightly emphasises the, the need for caution. The burden of the regulation on our citizens, of course, is uh, being uh, reduced, but the need for responsible behaviour uh, remains. Indeed, it is even more uh, important as we relax these uh, restrictions. Uh, I certainly agree with him in terms of, of clear messaging. That has been a, a point that has been raised uh, elsewhere. That has certainly always been something that I have tried to do. Um, when I come to this chamber, um, when I'm uh, rep replying to uh, individual requests that, that, that members have, uh, trying to get guidance out, listening to interested parties from across Northern Ireland, uh, it's certainly um, been to the fore of, of what I've been trying to do. And, and I want to agree with him completely uh, whenever he said that this is not a green or an orange is issue. It absolutely is not, Mr. D Mr. Deputy Speaker. Excuse me. It's definitely not uh, a green or an orange issue. There is nothing um, that is less green uh, or orange because there's nothing that's more important than, than when we are dealing uh, with, with human life. And I want to make it clear that this has always been uh, my approach. Indeed, the First Minister uh, has made it very, very clear uh, that her focus uh, and the focus of the executive needs to be on the health uh, and the lives and the livelihoods of people in Northern Ireland. And that is what has directed us uh, during this uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, another issue that he, he raised was, was sporting events. And can I assure the member this is something that is uh, being looked at. Uh, we understand the, the need for, for people to be able to, to go back. We understand how sporting organisations require the, the income that comes from that. There are obviously other issues to consider uh, around that. Um, uh, but we will progress this, as with all other measures, as, as soon as we can. But uh, I thank him for, for raising that. Uh, today. Uh, the Chair of the, the Health Committee um, set out the uh, Committee's position and uh, I just want to say that I do note, note the points that he has raised in relation to testing kits uh, and PPE uh, and I will ask um, the Department of Health and, and the Minister um, to send a written response to the uh, member on those specific points uh, that he had raised. Um, I want to also welcome uh, Mrs Cameron's uh, support for uh, larger gatherings to facilitate social events and I certainly agree with her on the need for cautious and responsible behaviour uh, at such gatherings. She, she rightly emphasises the importance of guidance to help businesses to operate uh, safely and I assure her um, that my colleague the Minister for the Economy will continue to, to give that uh, a high priority. Uh, we do have to recognise and understand that there has been an economic impact um, to the regulations and restrictions that we have had to uh, bring in. We understand that that is causing economic uncertainty, and she, she is right to mention it. Of course, it's not only an economic crisis, it is also a health crisis, a non-COVID health crisis uh, as well, and she articulated that uh, in her comments and, uh, when she referred uh, especially to the, uh, to the reopening of services. Uh, and I thank her for mentioning dentists in particular. I'm sure members all across the House have received representations uh, from those within the dental profession. Uh, they should not be uh, forgotten about. Um, they need our help and our support at this time um, because we are there uh, or they are there uh, when, when we need uh, them uh, also. And um, I would just say to, to the member that a, a, a strategic a strategic framework uh, for rebuilding health and social care services has been published and Northern Ireland's trusts have published plans setting out uh, the immediate work being done in their areas. This rebuilding process can secure better ways of delivering services but will require innovation, sustained investment and society-wide uh, support but keeping the public and staff safe is an absolute uh, priority and I agree uh, with the other comments. Uh, that she made in, in relation to that. She also raised another uh, a couple of issues, one of which was in relation to the R number. Uh, the latest figures that uh, we have is that the R number uh, in Northern Ireland for last week was between 0.5 and 1. The uh, R number for the Republic of Ireland last week was between 1.2 and 1.8. And England, Scotland and Wales for the last week were all uh, below one, and I hope that that provides uh, some clarity to the member. And on that point, I would agree uh, with what Mr. Uh, Beatty had said. Yes, um, obviously there are lots of um, lots of data and evidence that we have to take into consideration, but the R number still remains important and is an important tool uh, for us as as we move forward. Um, 
Finally, the, um, Mrs Cameron mentioned the, the 12th of July celebrations. And, um, can I take this opportunity uh, to commend everyone involved um, for the exceptionally high level um, of adherence to, to the regulations uh, over that period? Um, we understand how, how important um, the date is uh, in, our, in our calendar. We understand how people want uh, to, to celebrate. Obviously, this year was different, and I do think it is important that we place on record and we recognise uh, that people found alternative ways uh, to celebrate, uh, and they did so um, in, in a largely um, a, a safe way with very, very high levels of, of compliance. And I do want to put on record uh, our thanks to the, to the leadership of, of the Loyal Order, who really did demonstrate leadership um, in the advice that they gave and in the encouragement uh, that they gave. And I'm delighted that tens of thousands of people uh, threw themselves in um, to, to, to the spirit of the um, uh, regulations and ensured that they were adhered to uh, and they are to be commended uh, for that. Can I also um, acknowledge um, Pat Sheehan's um, support for the direction of travel and for the uh, gradual restoration of uh, normal life um, with access to uh, facilities um, such as uh, museums? Um, he mentioned that it's important that we follow the, the evidence, and I completely uh, agree with him uh, on that. And I think that's why we have to recognise and follow the advice of our own advisers. He mentioned uh, Professor Scali, who's not a member uh, of the uh, SAGE group. Um, our own medical advisers are. Uh, and just in relation to the, to the issue of, of travel, the Department of Health, uh, advised by their advisers, have been, have been very clear. Um, that there have been very few travel-associated cases that have been identified, and the possibility of a traveller from England bringing the virus to Northern Ireland is very low in terms of absolute risk. So it's important that we uh, acknowledge that as well when we make decisions. And as always, our decisions need to be based on the evidence that is there and on nothing else. Can I also acknowledge the comments um, that Kelly Armstrong uh, has made and say that I agree wholeheartedly um, with what she had to say in relation to our carers. Um, they support the most vulnerable in society. And I know uh, how difficult it has been uh, for some people not to have had carers to be able to come in in some cases and not to have uh, that respite care in place. Nobody wants this situation to last one minute longer uh, than necessary. We need to ensure that as we reopen our services and society, yes, we do so in a safe, matter, a safe matter, manner that uh, ensures we do not overload the capacity of our, of our health service, but we also need to make sure uh, that we don't put vulnerable people uh, at risk either. And um, the regulations are undergoing frequent revision uh, and the issues that the member has raised are part of the discussions and the considerations that are taking place at the executive. Mm -hmm. But she very firmly uh, placed it on the record today uh, and we thank her for that. Um, like other members, uh, Mr Chambers rightly emphasised the ongoing threat of the virus and the balance uh, that we need to maintain as we reduce regulation. So there must be more emphasis on guidance and responsible uh, behaviour. And a number of members have referred uh, to scientific debate uh, in the media. And let me again reassure members that executive decisions are informed by advice from the CMO and the CSA, and they in turn have direct access uh, to the most comprehensive expert uh, advice. Um, now on the timing of the regulations, um, the member acknowledges that regulations are changed as quickly as possible after the executive's decision to do so, in keeping with the requirement that we relax restrictions as soon as we can. Uh, now, it has always been the case um, that the regulations are laid uh, and they're laid before the assembly and brought into uh, force, normally very close together in time, normally later on that evening. There's no conspiracy uh, behind that. There's no other reason. Uh, I, I take the member's point that it may seem strange that at 11 o'clock there's one rule in place and at, at 11.30 there could be uh, another rule in place. They have to change uh, at some point uh, and we bring them in. We're based on bringing them in um, as soon as we can and, and that's what guides us. And I hope that provides some, uh, some clarity to the member. Um, 
uh, yeah, just want to, to comment on, on Doug Beattie's remarks as well, and certainly agree with um, uh, his comments on the significant uh, significance of the of the regulations. These aren't just merely technical uh, changes, but they further progress towards the gradual restoration of the normal daily activities uh, that we all hold dear and which are so important to the economy and to the health uh, and well-being um, of our uh, people. Um, Mr. Temporary uh, Speaker, I hope that that answers most of the uh, questions and uh, the comments that members uh, have uh, raised. If there's anything, though, that uh, I have missed, we will, of course, uh, write to members in, in, uh, in due course. But in the meantime, I commend the regulations to the Assembly. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lands. Um, the question is that the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment No. 9 Regulations Northern Ireland 2020 be approved. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. I understand that the, uh, the debate has already occurred on Amendment No. 10. Uh, could I call upon uh, Mr Kearney to formally move the motion? I beg to move. Thank you, Mr Kearney. Um, the question is that the Health Protection Coronavirus Amendment No. 10, Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, be approved. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. Uh, I believe the, I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Thank you very much. Uh, we now move on to the consideration stage of the Executive Committee Functions Bill. I now call upon the junior minister, Mr Decton Kearney, to formally move the bill.